The grace and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Good morning, everyone, wherever you are and whatever your circumstances. I'm glad that you're able to join us for this time of worship, time when we can pull together in prayer, focus on on God's word and perhaps see more clearly the way ahead for our Christian life. We pray that God's blessing will be upon us all at this time. Let's worship God together as we sing, O send thy light forth and thy truth. Friends, there's no better way to be led into prayer than through the words of the psalmist. He says to us this morning, Have mercy on me, O God, have mercy on me, for in you my soul takes refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Let us pray. God, our Father, we come to you as a people who now know what it means to live in the heat of crisis, to live in anxiety for ourselves and those we love, and to be uncertain of the future, to hear of the sick and the bereaved, and to feel powerless to help, to receive mixed messages, and to wonder where to turn. But your word assures us that there is refuge from all of this in the shadow of your wings. Where there is knowledge of your eternal presence, where there is the assurance that your good purpose is going forward, where there is the possibility of peace in your promise that nothing will ever separate us from your love. We praise you, Father, that all of this comes to us, not just in words, but in the person of Jesus, who stands with us in our suffering and has overcome death itself for our sake. He is the one who longed to enfold the people of his day as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And we pray for grace to respond to his longing today, to experience his embrace and to be sure that he is with us until the disaster has passed. Until that day, help us to be honest with you about the things that need to be forgiven. Help us to reflect more deeply on your word. Help us to retain the vision 
that whatever we are, wherever we are, we are called to preserve the things that are good and to bring light into the midst of darkness. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read together in God's word, friends, as we turn to the Old Testament and the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 10, reading from verse 21 to the end of the, the chapter, but we'll be mainly focusing in the preaching on verses 21 to 23. This comes from the time when the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt, and having come under the leadership of, of Moses, God sends plagues upon the people of Egypt until Pharaoh can be persuaded to let the people of Israel go from Egypt back to the land that God had promised them. And we're focusing today on <clears throat> one of the plagues, which was the plague of darkness. The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards the sky so that darkness will spread over Egypt, darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand towards the sky and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or leave his place for three days. Yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, Go, worship the Lord. Even your women and children may go with you. Only leave your flocks and herds behind. But Moses said, You must allow us to have sacrifices and burnt offerings to present to the Lord our God. Our livestock too must go with us. Not a hoof is to be left behind. We have to use some of them in worshipping the Lord our God. And until we get there, we will not know what we are to use to worship the Lord. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Pharaoh said to Moses, get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Just as you say, Moses replied, I will never appear before you again. God will bless to us the reading of his word and to his name be all praise and glory. We sing together now, there is a hope.
Let us pray. God, our Father, through the history of your people, you have sent messages to encourage them, to disturb them, to show them the way forward in the life of faith. And we pray that today as we seek to listen to the ancient voices of faith, that your Holy Spirit would be active now to bring your truth to our hearts, that we might go forward as a more committed and a more loving people. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, folks, I wonder if you've ever heard of a man called Chris Hadfield. He is a retired astronaut, but in his working life, if I can put it like that, he was the commander of the International Space Station. He's been active in his retirement, and one of the things that he has done is to produce a children's book, which was about, which is rather about a wee boy called Chris, so you can maybe deduce that there's some autobiographical content in this. But the thing about Chris is that he's very much afraid of the dark. And nighttime, when he's in bed, is a particular trial for him. All kinds of anxieties and, and fears come bursting into, into his mind. But there was a turnaround for him when he was no longer afraid of the dark. And it came about when he watched, along with his family, the very first moon landing. When he saw Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepping out on that very strange terrain, if I can put it that way. That was the moment when he realized that although the universe was a very dark place, and you could see that in the images, still great things could happen in the darkness. Great things which would inspire succeeding generations. And that came to, to rest in Chris's heart when he realized that he had to put up with the darkness, but his dream of becoming an astronaut himself sometime in the future would never be affected. The darkness from that point on held no fear for him. Now, we read in our passage together about a darkness, a darkness that fell upon the land of Egypt. And it was a deep darkness. We're told that people couldn't see as they tried to move from one place to another. We're told that they couldn't see one another. I'm sure maybe you've heard, maybe you've described the darkness in these terms that you couldn't see your hand in, in front of your face. Well, it was very much like that. It was a deep darkness that came from God as one of the plagues that sought to persuade Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go from their slavery. But it was more than just a physical darkness, I believe, because the principal god of Egypt at that time was the sun god, Ra, who was personified by the Pharaoh. And Ra was seen to be the, the life force for the whole of, of the world. And so to have the, the, the sun obscured as it was at this time, then there was great psychological and spiritual disturbance in the lives of the Egyptian people. The miraculous thing was, though, that wherever the Hebrews were, the people of Israel, wherever they were, there was light. We're told that wherever they stayed, wherever they gathered, there was light for them to see. And this was surely a sign for them and for anyone else who could understand 
This was a sign that there was something happening in the darkness. Something was, was happening which would eventually lead to their freedom, to them being led from the, the, their slavery back to the, the promised land. Something was happening which would inspire succeeding generations who regarded themselves as being in bondage. Because this light that shone for them in the darkness was an assurance that God was with them in this moment. They continued to be a, a suffering people. Moses came to them and, and assured them that God had seen their suffering, that he had heard their cries, and he would be working by their side in order to deliver them from their bondage. In the midst of the darkness, this deep physical and spiritual darkness that had come upon Egypt, the light of God's presence was, was shining. And that is, that's been a, a, a thread which you can trace through the whole of Scripture, that sometimes suffering comes upon God's people and they don't always understand why this has come upon them. But what they are assured of is that God is present with them in that moment. And this continues into what we regard as, as the New Testament. When we find the ultimate assurance of this in the personality of Jesus. Because the writer of the letter to the Hebrews says that he was tested at every point. He was tested at every level of human experience, physically, mentally, spiritually, and yet was without sin. And so when suffering comes upon us, and we're at a loss to explain, to make sense of it, to get a handle on it. We can look to the Lord Jesus and know that he is present with us in this moment. Did he not say to his disciples, I am with you always, always, even in the midst of the darkness. So the light that miraculously shone for the Hebrew people had a message, God is with you. But it was also saying that God was in control of this moment, this moment of, of deep darkness, because it began with God and it lasted only for the time that he saw fit. It had a beginning and it had an end when God said, enough. Now, there's definitely a case for saying that, that this was a time that was, that was measured by God. We're told it was three days. It may literally have been three days or that may have just have been a way of, of talking that this was a specific time that the darkness fell upon the land. But the point is that it came to an end when God decreed that the end had come. Now, I understand that for, for many people, times of sufferings don't ever seem to come to an end. Some of us know what it is to come to the end of a period of, of sickness and, and, and to rejoice in that. Some people never, ever see an end to their sufferings. I was speaking to someone just the other week there who was talking about the country of Sudan at this present moment. It's a place that is politically very dangerous. And it's also one of the the most economically challenged 
countries in the world, one of the poorest nations in the world. And it's hard to envisage many people believing that their suffering in that land will ever come to an end. This person said to me, actually, COVID is the least of their problems on top of everything else that has to be endured. We recognize this, friends, but we also recognize that in the midst of whatever deep darkness a, a, a community is having to go through, there are people working to intervene to make life more tolerable through scientific research, through medical expertise, through economic planning. But even where that fails, we have a promise which comes to us in the Christian gospel that there will be a day when the darkness has spent itself, when the darkness will be enveloped in the light of the presence of the risen and ascended Lord Jesus Christ. I love that passage in 1 Corinthians, which has an image of Jesus returning to this earth, cleaning up the earth, purging it of all its impurities, flushing out all the pollution, sending his light into the darkest areas of human experience, once again restoring the earth to its, its pristine purity and then handing it over to his Father. Job done. We have that promise to hold in our hearts that these days of, of suffering, these days of perplexity, these days of despair are measured. And the day has been set when God will reveal himself as being in control through his son, Jesus. So we're seeing this, this community who has been given assurance of God's presence and that God is, is in control of their circumstances. And in the end, the ultimate assurance will be that God sees for them a great purpose in his plans for the universe. Right from the very beginning, this people have had a sense of being set apart from all the other nations in the world. God has chosen them to be his people. And through so many difficult experiences in their existence, they have been preserved and they have also been assured that they have a great purpose in the eyes of God. That purpose was to be a light to the nations. The one nation which would lead all others to worship the true God, to be united in that God at the great climax of all creation. All of this despite the suffering that they may have to go through. All of this despite the, the times of unfaithfulness that they themselves might show in their spiritual lives. God had established for them a destiny to be the light of the world. And that would be fulfilled in the day when from the community of Israel the Son of God would emerge, the one who was the light of the world and who calls his followers today to be the light of the world. And that might not sit easily with, with people like us, part of the Christian community in, in the West at this time. But whatever challenges we face, we cannot shake off this destiny that Jesus has for his church to be witnesses 
of his light in the present and to see ourselves as part of that great moment at the end of all things when the whole of creation will once again be united in Christ. We started with uh, an image of a wee boy who was frightened of the, of the dark. The Apostle Paul was conscious of the darkness. He once spoke about the, the, the universe in its darkness. But he says it's lit up by the stars. And he said to one Christian congregation in his days, you are called to be the stars in this generation, to be the light that shows God in the midst of our suffering, to have that faith that God is in control and to believe in the purpose that he has brought to our life and work. That's the faith in which we need to go forward, friends, from this day. Let us pray. God, our Father, we come to you today as part of a scattered people throughout the world. But we pray that for everyone, in whatever culture, in whatever land, that you would come to your people today with your assurance that despite our distance from one another, we are bound together by your Spirit, that we can still find strength in your word, that opportunities will still fall to us to tell the story of Jesus, to share his love with those in need, and to bring light in the midst of darkness. We pray for our world where many nations are seeking a way through crisis, where leaders of nations are hard-pressed, where medical resources are strained, where the ever-present problems of poverty and injustice have been exacerbated. Father, you are Lord of the nations. We need signs of your love and goodness. We need signs of your kingdom bursting forth. But let it begin with us. We pray for our nation, our leaders daily under pressure to seek the best for those they serve. Give them your wisdom. Our medical people daily in danger of exhaustion and infection. Keep them safe and strong. So many facing the emptiness of bereavement, the discomfort of illness, the prospect of unemployment, fear for the future. Grant them your peace. We bring our personal prayers for young people whose studies have been interrupted over the past two years and are anxious for the future. For those who for any reason feel uncertain, ill at ease, in danger of being overwhelmed, for those who for any reason are a concern to us at a personal level, we pray that you would visit them all with a steadiness of heart, a renewal of purpose and healing in body and in mind. And we gather all our prayers in the words that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We sing together, Lord, the light of your love is shining.
Now may you go in peace with the light of God in your eyes, the word of God on your lips, and the love of God in your hearts, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.